I'd like to talk to you about the AIUM guidelines for obstetrical ultrasound. The newest set of guidelines were adopted by the AIUM in 2007. Um, previously, a, the American College of Radiology and the American College of Gynecology had adopted the same guidelines in 2003. These are clinical um, standards that we can use as practice guidelines. Um, they are minimal, minimum criteria for, um, to complete the examination, which has been identified for physicians performing obstetrical ultrasound, and they're often used um, for a basis of a standard of care for malpractice cases. Well, if you look at the fetus and see how small it is on a, a scale uh, nine weeks and then moving up to 38 weeks and all the way to term, you can see how the size of the fetus and the formation changes over time. At seven weeks, when the crown rump length is 12 millimeters, you can see that we barely have um, limb buds, uh, a little ear bud, and that the head and neck are um, really quite large in comparison to the rest of the body. But by 11 weeks, when the crown rump length is 44 millimeters, you can easily see the arms and legs and face, eye and ear. Now we talk about different ages from, um, for the fetus. From conception, we often call it conceptual age or fetal age or gestational age. And from the last menstrual period, menstrual age. Um, ultrasound, we often call it ultrasound age, and when we began doing ultrasound, we started talking about the gestational age based on the last menstrual period. So there's a little bit of confusion in what each of these mean. Now, we also talk about what the fetus should be called. From zero to 10 weeks, it should be called an embryo, and from 10 to 40 weeks, a fetus. We talk about cardiac activity prior to 24 weeks, and we talk about viability um, after 24 weeks. That's because that's when we think the fetus could survive outside the womb. Now the introduction to the guidelines state that the um, fetal sonography should be performed only for valid medical reasons, that we should use the lowest possible ultrasound exposure settings, that the exam, um, there will be limited exams in clinical emergencies or for limited uh, purposes like just to check for cardiac activity or fetal position or amniotic fluid index. Um, there is, can, you, we can do a limited exam for follow-up after there's been a primary exam when we're looking to evaluate for growth or re-evaluations of specific abnormalities. The guidelines talk about a first trimester set, then a standard second and third trimester, and then the limited exam as we discussed earlier. Um, specialized exams or cardiac echoes, um, detailed exams based on history or biochemistry like for alpha feta protein or um, aneuploidy screening, and then specialized exams including the biophysical profile and Doppler studies. Now the indications for first trimester scan are to confirm the presence of intrauterine pregnancy, suspected ectopic, vaginal bleeding, pelvic pain, estimated gestational age, multiple gestations, confirmed cardiac activity, chorionic villus sampling, embryo transfer, localization or removal of IUD. To assess for certain fetal anomalies, this was added new in the 2007 guidelines that we finally now are recommending that fetuses be screened for anomalies. Also, pelvic um, masses in the mother or uterine abnormalities and for possible hydatidiform mole. In the first trimester, the exam can be done transabdominally, transvaginally, or transperineally, whichever is appropriate for that um, clinical symptom. We are supposed to look for the gestational sac and we should evaluate um, the uterus, the cervix, and the adnexa for the location of that sac. We should identify the presence or absence of the yolk sac. Uh, we should identify where the, the embryo is identified, and we should record the crown rump length measurement if we can see an embryo. And if we cannot see the embryo, then we should measure the sac size. For the presence or car absence of cardiac activity, we should be able to see cardiac activity by the time the embryo measures five millimeters or greater. Um, if the embryo is less than five millimeters, then lack of cardiac activity um, tells us that we may need an additional exam to determine whether it's going to be a uh, uh, viable pregnancy in the long run. Now, here's a gestational sac, and you can see the crown rump length. 
um, right here, the yolk sac to the right, this is the gestational sac. And here we have a measurement for the crown rump length in the um, embryo that measures 33 millimeters. The um, fetal number must be recorded and the amnionicity and chorionicity should be documented for multiple pregnancies. So what are we talking about? We're talking about um, amnionicity and chorionicity being whether they are diamniotic, dichorionic, like we can see in the upper and A here with two placentas in this case, and um, four layers of membrane being a thick membrane. The um, diamniotic, dichorionic can also have a single placenta as seen in B. And C, we have monochorionic um, uh, uh, amnionicity and chorionicity with a single placenta and a thin um, separating membrane there with the two amnions. And then in D, there's no separating membrane, which is monoamniotic, monochorionic. In this um, case, in the upper uh, image, we can see a gestational sac with two yolk sacs um, and suggesting that it is um, have a, an amnion in between. And in the lower right, we have twins with very thick separating membrane that is uh, consistent with diamniotic, dichorionic placentation. If we have multiple um, embryos, then we need to identify how many there are. As you can see in this uh, picture, we see one, two, three, four, five embryos in this single slice. Um, Diamnion dichorioning um, will once again have that thick membrane in the late first trimester, as you can see here with the um, placenta growing up in between them, whereas the diamnionic monochorionic um, will not have um, a, a twin peak and it'll be very thin and wispy here um, going out to be uh, identified as a dimo. We should see the gestational sac by five weeks, the yolk sac by 5.5 weeks, and an embryo by six weeks. Early work um, showed that if you had HCG levels by um, 1,000, we should be able to see a gestational sac. By 7,200, we should see a yolk sac, and by 10,800, heart tones. We remember this as the 1711 rule. Now, a normal sac will have a nice deciduous ring. There may be a double deciduous sac seen or may not. Um, it'll be smooth. The embryo, if we're doing transabdominal, should be present by 27 millimeters, whereas if um, transvaginal, we should see it by 5 millimeters. Um, in general, we do do transvaginal in these early pregnancies to be able to identify them. Here we can see a very small um, uh, uh, crown rump length with a little tiny yolk sac. Now, an abnormal sac will um, have the sac size, embryo, and cardiac activity inappropriate for those gestational ages that we just recorded. You may see angles in the sac, or it may be collapsed. There may be a poor decidual reaction. And if you do follow-up studies, it'll grow less than 0.6 millimeters per day. A pseudogestational sac seen with ex, um, ectopic pregnancies can also um, mimic uh, a gestational sac. So this is an abnormal gestational sac with a large uh, yolk sac and really kind of irregular and angulated um, um, edges. This also is an abnormal gestational sac with lots of multiple lucencies within it, and this would be something quite worrisome for trophoblastic disease. Um, approximately 25% of pregnancies will have vaginal bleeding and approximately 50% will go on and spontaneously abort.